All right, well, thanks for being here this morning, church. We're thankful uh, for what's going on this morning. We sing a song like Resurrender, and surrender is, it's a lot harder when things are going well, and surrender is something that uh, when, when life keeps on hitting you in the face, it feels like it's a little bit easier to surrender. And, uh, you know, I got a call last night at, uh, at 6 o'clock from Tony Plummer during dinner, and I thought, oh, I'm going to have to preach tomorrow. And he, uh, don't worry, I'm not. Uh, but he's also, yeah, that's a little bit too much. We don't need that. But I do have a privilege this morning because um, somebody else is going to be able to share the word of God with you. And this is, uh, this is one of the first missionaries that we ever sent out from GCBC. And you know Ryan Boyette. And I just want to say a couple of things about him before he comes up. Uh, he's been a missionary in the Sudan for 15 years. Is that right? 18, 18 years. Very nice. So I'll tell you the story because, so one of the things that I, I always try to talk to students about, and we even mentioned it when, we were, when I was up here on stage a few weeks ago, you want to live a life that is lived in such a way that when people see what God has done through you, they don't say, wow, look at him, look at her. She's amazing. They say their God is amazing because they're not capable of that person I'm looking at is not capable of that, but God is capable of amazing things. And that's Ryan's story, uh, just what, what God has been able to do through his life. I remember, this has been seven or eight years ago, the, he's had a, a lot of press come and, and do work with him, and Ann Curry was over there with NBC News, and so we had heard that that was going to happen, it was on a Wednesday night, NBC did this Wednesday night news show for a while, and so we had youth group on Wednesday night for the high school, and so I said, listen, we're going to take the last half hour of youth group, and we're actually going to watch... NBC's news coverage of what one of our missionaries is doing over in Sudan. And I, I'll never forget, we're watching it. There was probably a, a dozen of us who were able to stick around. And one of the high school boys, he was a junior in high school, and he says, who is this guy? And so I explained it to him. He goes, why is he doing this? With this sort of, why would anybody do this on purpose? And then, and, but it was this wonderful open door to be able to explain, like, this is what the gospel is. This is what the Great Commission is. And so to see what it looks like lived out in real time, I mean, his, his dedication to God has shown up in his dedication to this country. You know, when you read Thessalonians or Philippians, you see how much Paul loved these people. Uh, he wasn't doing it out of obligation. He was doing it because he genuinely loved these people in the name of Jesus. And so um, I could talk about it for a while, but we love Ryan. So uh, why don't you welcome up Ryan Boyette to the stage, everybody. Thanks, Travis. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. So, I am a few, uh, two days ago, I knew I was coming to this church and I thought I was going to see Pastor Tony and Pastor Jonathan, so I got a haircut. Um, and now they're not even here to see my haircut, so I hope they're online watching and they see my haircut. <laughs> um, let me pray before, before we start. Father God, I just want to come before you today, and uh, as I stand up at this pulpit, Lord, I just pray that it is your voice that comes out, Lord. Uh, there's nothing that I have done that isn't because of you. And God, I just pray that you give me the words to say, uh, give us ears to hear and hearts to take in this word. Uh, we love you, Lord, and pray these things in your name. Amen. So I realize when I come to this church, I, every time I come, I am uh, so excited to be here because this is really, as Travis said, this is where I started. This is where I really got uh, the word of God and I really started to understand it and it made sense to me and it, and it caused a great calling upon my life. Um, I do want to mention uh, my friend Rich is here. <laughs> you changed my life. Um, so many times sitting in your youth groups and hearing God's word, uh, your messages were strong and as well as Tony as well. And those messages that I constantly heard from these men of God, uh, changed my life and put me in a trajectory to do the work that I'm doing today. If it wasn't for that, I would not be, be where I am. 
So I do, before I start also, I do want to introduce to you someone who's been working with me in Sudan. Um, he is uh, a math teacher, an educator, passionate about education. Ryan McLaughlin is here with me. And he has been coming to Sudan with me to help me with the education work, which I'll explain more about. Um, but I realize I have come here uh, several times, but the last time I've been here was about three years ago. And I realize there's a lot of people here that maybe don't know my story, some do. So I do want to give a little brief um, kind of overview of my story and the story of my family and what, why I ended up in Sudan. Maybe answer the question of that, um, that kid in youth group, why would I do this? Uh, so... In 2002, I had graduated college from University of South Florida. I, I, I read an article at the same time I was about to join the FBI or US Customs. I had finished the process, I was about to go to, uh, to join them. And then I read an article uh, that my sister gave me about war in Sudan. As I read this article, it was about a pastor who refused to close the doors of a church. And the army uh, had declared jihad, the government had declared jihad against the people uh, of the region. And the Islamic government said no churches could be open, the churches must be closed. And this pastor walks beyond the army, opens the church door, and, uh, and rang the bell. And as a result, he was beaten by the army, and he was tied up and drugged behind a car. And this is the article that I read. And I became angry. I became frustrated. Why, had, why was no one doing anything about this? Uh, you know, I am a college graduate at, the, at that time, and I had never heard of a 30-year civil war that had been going on in Sudan in which many Christians were being persecuted. So long story short, I joined Samaritan's Purse, and I arrived in Sudan in April 2003. And when I got there, I was, I was excited at first. Um, I was passionate about the work that, that I was about to do. And then uh, the doors of the plane opened and it was 115 degrees. And I, it kind of blew me back and I thought, oh, wh what, what did I do now? Um, so I worked with Samaritan's Purse for eight years doing various jobs. Um, Samaritan's Purse does a really good Good job in regions like Sudan. They go to areas like that. They work, they work very hard, very hard working teams. Um, but I arrived during a window of peace. So there was about 20 year civil war. Then there was a window of peace. And that's when I arrived. And I started to get to know the Nuba people. I started traveling around and doing all sorts of work. The Nuba Mountains is about the size of Massachusetts. And it has about a million people from 56 different tribes. So I would... I would move around all these villages and we'd stay in the homes with people. There's no infrastructure, there's no buildings, there's no uh, running water, electricity, no roads. Uh, so it's extremely remote, one of the most remote places you can imagine, especially when I arrived uh, 18 years ago. So when, we, when I started doing that, I started learning uh, a lot about the culture and the people. I started learning the language. Um, would you like to learn some of the language? Okay. Let's do, um, let's say, they speak Arabic, but they also speak their tribal language. So I'll teach you Arabic. So uh, let's say, all right, Jesus is Yesu. So everyone say Yesu. 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 All right. Uh, to say Jesus loves you is Bihibak. That one's harder. So Yesu, then Bihib, Ak. Ak is you. So Yesu, Bihibak. All right, turn to your neighbor and say, Yesu Bahibuk. <laughs> Some of you sounded better than others. <laughs> so after about eight years of working with Samaritan's Purse, we rebuilt churches, did all kinds of work. We worked extremely hard. I felt entrenched in, in what God was doing. I was, I was impassioned and, and just, I felt surrounded by people that love Christ. And, and I felt so driven. I felt like nothing could, could stop me because, and even if it did, Christ's mission was going on and I was so encouraged. Um, and then at the end of about five years of me being there, um, we started seeing signs of war, that war may come back. Within those signs, war hadn't started yet. Uh, and I married my wife, Jazira, who is from Sudan. Um, we were married in 2011, February. 
but those signs kept continuing. And then we started to see war was coming back. In June, 2011, uh, June 6, 2011, uh, the airplane started flying over and bombs started falling in the region. We live on a plateau and on either side of us are, are larger villages. And on those larger villages, there was, um, uh, we could hear the fighting, the, gun, the gunshots. So Samaritans first called me. They said, you need to evacuate. I said, I'm sorry, we, we have to stay. Uh, they said, we can't accept that. You have to come out. And so my wife and I prayed about it and we resigned. Then we created a media organization to fill the gaps of media because we knew the article that I read, no one else would be getting those stories out. So for the next eight years, we were reporting on the conflict. And everywhere we would go, we would see, I would interview people that had been, their, their villages had been burned down. They'd run inside caves, they're living in caves, uh, no food, uh, n- hardly any clothes, maybe what they could have carried in, in one hand um, and carrying a child in another. And th- the situation was really very, very bad. And I interviewed hundreds of these people over an eight year period. And my team that I built up interviewed them. And as we interviewed people, I always asked them, what's your greatest need? And surprisingly, they would always say education. Always. And I was like, I don't think you heard the question right. Uh, You're starving. There's bombs. And uh, I would like to know what you need. And they'd always say education. So So I tried to understand why. And they said, we need education because... The, we've been living in war for, for so long. We know what it is to starve, but we'll never get out of this problem unless we have education. And I thought it was this beautiful representation of they, their, their worldly oppression, their worldly oppression from this government that has been attacking them. They see knowledge and wisdom and understanding helping them out of that. And that analogy to us and our uh, oppression in this world uh, from Satan and from our own sin causing us separation from Christ, but knowledge and understanding and wisdom in him drawing us closer to him each and every day. And I love that analogy. So Jazeera and I, after eight years, decided to come back to the States to go to school and, and build and start an organization called To Move Mountains. So we started To Move Mountains for the sole purpose of supporting Christian education for children living in areas of conflict in the Nuba Mountains. Right now, I want to give you a little update about my family. I, I graduated for, from Vanderbilt University, which is the fact that I got into Vanderbilt University. I mean, I went to Florida for education. Uh, so it, it's a miracle that I even got in there. Um, but unlike me, my wife is extremely smart. Um, even though she lived in Nuba her whole life, her village was burned down five times as a kid. Uh, she went through... Uh, school while bombing was taking place during times of starvation, and she is now making straight A's at Vanderbilt. Uh, One of the top schools ranked uh, in the top three in the nation in education, and she is studying education studies. But the whole reason we came back is to get that education, to do it right for for the children of Nuba. They deserve that. And that's why we found people like Ryan and other staff. So with that update, and, and that said, I want to now kind of dig into God's word a little bit about some experiences that I had and experiences that people had in the Bible about uh, encounters with, with God and what happened after those encounters and what those people did during those encounters with God. And I'm going to compare that to different encounters I had with God. So I want to talk about, do you, do you guys remember the story of Balak and Balaam? Okay. I actually forgot that story. Uh, so I had read that a couple weeks ago, and it kept coming, in, coming to mind, coming to mind. And I was reading about that, and I was thinking also about Paul, or when he was Saul, and the, both of their encounters with God at that moment. So uh, for, for those of you that don't really remember the story of Balaam, uh, so he is like an oracle. He's like a, a seer. Um, you know, almost like it, it, it makes a lot of sense in Nuba uh, because he's like almost like a witch doctor like we would have in Nuba. So people go and they call uh, witch doctors to come and say, hey, uh, you know, I like this guy, this woman, but this guy likes her. Can you put a curse on that guy so that she loves me? You know, that happens quite often. Or this guy did something bad to me. Can you put a curse on him? And you pay 
the witch doctor to do that, a goat or something like that. So it's very common. Now, in the story, if you just read the story of Balaam, it sounds like he's a great guy in the end, but later on in other chapters, you realize he turned back to the world. But let me, let me just overview the story of Balaam uh, so we can be reminded. So Balak is the king of Moab. The Israelites come to Moab and uh, Balak, the king, is like, oh no, these guys are strong. They just, they just took over the Amorites. What are we going to do? You know, he's worried that he's going to be taken over. So then he, call, he sends people down to Balaam. And Balaam is like, uh, no, I can't go against what God wants. These people are blessed. He's like, come on, Balaam, you need to help me. You need to help me. They send another group. And, and God tells him, no, you shouldn't go. Uh, but then there's an interesting thing here. and It's not really clear in the word, to me at least, uh, what was going on. First, God told him not to go. But then God said, okay, you, you can go. And I'm wondering, you know, to me, Balaam was a little bit of a swindler with his, uh, his magic and curses. So I wonder if Balaam was being tempted to go from, from that buildup in his heart. So as he went, uh, now we get to the donkey, which it's funny. Jonathan brought this to my mind when I told him what I was going to preach about. Last time I was here, I was talking about the triumphal entry of Jesus, and it was about a donkey. And I don't know why I like donkeys so much. <laughs> They're actually very annoying in Sudan when you're trying to preach, and then a donkey runs by the church and... <laughs> It's, so if we can go to Numbers chapter 22, chapter 22, verses 21 through 31. Numbers chapter 22, verses 21 through 31. So it says, Numbers 22, 21 through 31. Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the Moab officials. But God was very angry when he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the road and opposed him. Balaam was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, it turned off the road into a field. Balaam beat, beat it to get it back on the road. The angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path through the vineyards with walls on both sides. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it. So he beat the donkey again. And the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in the narrow place where there was no room to turn, either right or left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it it lay under, under Balaam, and he was angry and beat it with his staff. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and it said to Balaam, what have I done to you to make you beat me three time, these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, you have made a fool of me. If only I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The donkey said to Balaam, I am not your own donkey. Or am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been the habit of, have I been in habit of doing this to you? No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn and he bowed low and fell face down. So Balaam had this moment where he he realized what he was doing was wrong and he fell face down and he asked God to forgive him of his sin. And then he went and he actually blessed the Israelites, which caused King Balak to be angry with him. And so that's one story. Then we have the story of Saul, who is, has a lot of similarities. He had this encounter with God, and, we, and most of us know the story of Saul and Paul. Um, it's in Acts chapter 9. He, he got this bright light. He was blinded. He fell. God told him what to do. He followed what God said and went into the city, and he was later healed when Ananias came and saw him and the the scales came off his eyes and he saw again, right? We know this story. And he was baptized, repented of his sins and he he was baptized. That's in Acts chapter nine, verse 15 and 16. And then what happens after both of these stories is the difference. 
okay? What Balaam did, we learn later, is that he then continued to help Balak use, the, use his people of, the, of Moab to then trick the Israelites into following other gods, despite this encounter that he had with God. So he turned back to the world. What did, what did Saul do? Who was a murderer of Christians. He was no better than Balaam. But he then completely sold out for Jesus. 110, he completely sold out for Jesus and followed him with his entire life. So I want to go back to things that have happened in my life in these situations. And what it means to walk in line with Christ and what, the, with what comes after that, what blessing comes after that and what suffering comes after that. Balaam went and maybe got some worldly benefit from following Balak again. And Paul was put in jail and he was beaten, but he was joyful. He, he was joyful in his suffering. So I want to tell you something that, uh, that happened to me that kind of affected me in this way. Uh, it was a moment I've had, I feel like I've had several encounters with God in which he had to, you know, rub, rub me against the wall with the donkey or make the donkey sit down underneath me. And I want to share one of those times. So when the war was going on, uh, we were doing a lot of journalism and reporting. This is before we started to move mountains. And when we did that, there, there was a time, and I shared this story before, and I'll just mention it now, there was a time in which the Sudan government targeted me and my family and bombed our house. Uh, at that moment, something shifted in me, and I stopped doing things out of love, and I started doing it because I wanted revenge. I was angry. I was very, very angry. And so th that slowly started shifting my desires and my, I never lost faith in God, but I, I was turning to the world and trying to find success in what I was doing in the world. And so I was at church one day uh, and I was driving home and it's a very uh, rocky place, very hilly. Uh, there's no roads, as I mentioned, uh, but it was rainy season. So there was a lot of rain and I was leaving church and these two women said, can we uh, go with you and you drop us on the way? I said, yes. So we're driving up the mountain. I'm at the bottom of the mountain. I come to a river that's kind of flowing. There's no river, running rivers in Nuba, except when it rains, there's like flash flooding. So there was a small river and I thought, oh, this river is not that bad, uh, but I'll wait and see. Then, I, then a rock started appearing as the, as the water level started going low. I said, oh, I know that rock. Um, you know, I know a lot of rocks in Nuba. <laughs> Uh, so I know this rock. So let me, let me, I, you know, I know that my tire will not, wouldn't go all the way under. So the river's shallow enough. I can go through and it's flowing fast, but I can go through. So I went through next river, same thing. The women were a little nervous because no one can swim in Nuba. So they're like, oh, let's, let's wait. And I said, no, we're fine. We go through, we go through the next one. It is pouring rain. So we, we have the windows up. And for some reason, my car has electric windows in Nuba, which is, makes no sense whatsoever. Um, so the windows are up. It's now getting dark. Uh, it's, it's in the afternoon. The clouds are overcast. It's, it's becoming very dark outside. Um, as we continue going, there's a, there's a path. And the women said, oh, we're, we're getting down here. I said, okay. And I said, but it's raining. It's pouring. They're like, no, we'll go in this mud hut. I thank God that they got out. Uh, you, you'll hear why. Not because they were like, annoying or something. They're very nice ladies. <laughs> so we get, we get uh, to the path. I let them out and they wish me safe travels and they close the door and I continue. And the rain is getting harder and harder and harder. So then I'm at the top of the plateau because I live, I'm going back to my house. I live at the top of this plateau. And as, and as we approach this, uh, I approach this next river. I know that that river is not too bad because the people have actually built a road because it goes to the market. So some vehicles from other towns will come and trade in this, this market. So they built up the road in this river. And so I know it's higher. So I'm not even worried at all about this. So when I, as soon as my car goes down into the river, it does not come back up to go up the river. It just keeps going down. And within seconds, water was over my car. And I was inside the car. And immediately, uh, within a matter of 10 seconds, I'm flipping in the car as the car's rolling down the river. And the water's going fast. And it's pitch black out. I can't see a thing. 
the car, at the time, I don't know what happens, but the car stops and it's wedged between some rocks. And it smashes, so I'm, I'm on the driver's seat, it smashes the glass, I fall down, and now I'm, I'm looking up at the, at the passenger door. So the passenger door is up here, or sorry, the, the driver's door is up here and the passenger door is down here. And I, I feel the water running up my leg as it's coming up. I'm looking up, I have to get out of this car, I pull the headrest off of the, off of the, the car. I can't, I try to open the door. It won't open. It, I, I don't know why it won't open. I can't figure it out. Uh, I pull the headrest off of the, um, car. I mean the, the back seat and I, and I try to smash the, the window, but by that time the water's up to here and I can't get any momentum and it's not breaking. And then I realized I am going to die. It, it was as cl- clear as day to me that I, I am going to die in this car. And I thought I have one chance left. If I don't get this door open, I need to swim to the back. But I'm also thinking the car's going to keep flipping. And so I remember praying. I, by this time, I was in the corner of the car breathing like this. And I had this much air left. And I, I remember praying. And I, and I just said, God, I really wanted to grow old and see my kids grow up. And I, re- and I wanted to grow old with my wife. And if you still have a plan for me, please let this door open. And that's all I had time for. And I, and I opened the door and all I remember is the door like popped open. And I don't, I, I, to this day, I don't remember how I got out. And I just remember I was standing on top of the car on the a driver's door. I was standing on top of it and the water was like lapping around my ankles as it was f- continuing to flow. I jumped in the river. It beat me up. Uh, I hit like every rock, a uh, big stick went in my leg. Um, and, and I, I mean, I grew up in Florida, I'm a strong swimmer, but that river was strong. And it was this moment where God was rubbing my leg against the wall. And I did consider it in the end a blessing because it turned me back to what he wanted me to do. I was outside of what he was wanting me to do. And when he turned me back to that, uh, that is a moment of recognition and an encounter with God that changed my life again. And he's done that to me several times. Um, so when, we, when my wife and I decided to make to move mountains, we realized this is what he wanted us to do. So we left Nuba Reports. We handed all the media work to the Sudanese. They're doing a great job with it. And we knew that God was leading us to start to move mountains. He was always calling us to help uh, the children of Nuba uh, get the education they desire and at the same time know him. And so we have been building up this organization uh, for about uh, four years now. Um, So many things have happened that when you are in, uh, and and it's kind of like, I I relate this to, to, to Paul. Like even though he was suffering, even though he was working hard, he was you know, even though he was arrested, God still opened the doors to the prison for him to come out and allowed people to know him through that. And so I see now things are happening when you are walking in what Christ wants you to do. And all these frustrations I had before were gone. And everything that we have needed, every single thing that we have needed has been provided by God along the, along the way. I was thinking very small about what to move mountains would be. Maybe we would start a school that would be like a unique school in Nuba and provide enough education for, for one school. I'm going to tell you more about how God has expanded that in a minute. But let me explain to you just a few things that God has done with to move mountains that shows me that we are walking with him. It was all about Jazeera and I just giving everything to God. This is your organization. You just guide us. We, do, we don't know how to do education right. We need your help. So we come back to the U.S. to start the organization, get things moving. I was praying, God, I want a university to help us uh, connect how to do this education work in a right way. And so there's a missionary from South Sudan that I know, and he calls me up, and and we were living in uh, Boone, North Carolina at the time near my parents. And this is right when we came back from Sudan. And the this missionary was driving through the town and he said, Hey, can we have lunch together? I said, yeah. So we go have lunch. And he, I told him what my vision is. And I said, but I don't know how to build it. And he says, um, well, why don't you talk to Vanderbilt? And I said, well, 
I don't know anyone at Vanderbilt. That school is, you know, very advanced. Like, I don't know how we can be connected with them. And, and I said, also, it's, it's a secular school. It's not a Christian school. And, and I don't know what God feels about that. So Vanderbilt just kept coming up. And then he called me again. He said, hey, I really think you need to meet with Vanderbilt. Here's the name of a friend of ours that works there. And I said, okay. I go there. First lady I meet, her name is Rosie. She said, she's a believer. She's like, can we pray about this? I said, yeah. So we prayed about it. She's like, I want you to meet Professor Patrick. I meet Professor Patrick. He's a believer. And I'm like, okay. Um, then he's like, Ryan, I want Jazeera to come here and you and tell the whole faculty about this. So I'm like, okay. So then I bring Jazeera and, uh, we tell the whole faculty and they're like, whoa, this is, this is amazing. Like this is a place where people want education so bad. And you can start this new thing that we know use research that we know works. And I said, yeah. And, and can you help us? And they said, well, can you go to school here? Because that's the easiest way we can help you. And I said, well, Jazeera has been looking for a school. Jazeera can come here. And, uh, and they said, no, you need to do a master's program. And I said, one, for one thing, like I said, education in Florida. <laughs> Number two, it's a lot of money. And they said, no, I think we can get a scholarship. So I ended up going to Vanderbilt. I got my master's degree in international education, paid for. Uh, Jazeera's on a full ride scholarship. She's, she will be done in a year and a half. So this is one thing that, and, and there's so much after that, that I'm leaving out. Then on the other side of it, in Nuba, I'm going back to Nuba two to three times a year. And so there is, uh, we brought people together from all over Nuba, from the, the churches, the um, community leaders, women, uh, students. And we said, okay, we want to build an education system that works for you. So what do you need? And they said, what do we, we're like, what do you want your children to be like, know, and do? And we had this big education conference. And I said, we want to make a Nuba curriculum for all the schools of Nuba. So now my mind is thinking bigger, not just a school. We're thinking we are going to make something for 300 schools in Nuba that the Nuba people made themselves. So I'm like, this is, this is awesome, God. Like, thanks for doing this. And, and, I, and this guy gets up and he says, Ryan, I think you're doing the wrong thing. And... I said, okay, what, what do you think we should be doing? And he's, and he's talking to a lot of people. And he says, um, we, don't make, we don't need to make a Nuba curriculum. We need to make a curriculum for all Sudan. And I said, how and why? And he said, because uh, the Arabs forced us to take Arabic names. They forced us to learn Islam. They forced us by, by force, they forced us to change our entire identity about who we are and our culture. And so we don't want to do the same thing to them. So let's make a curriculum that's for all Sudan. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. So now what we have right now, what started as an idea of we want to make an education system, we don't know what it looks like. We want to teach Jesus in this education system in a place that is 90% Muslim. And now we have people standing up and saying, let's make this curriculum be for all Sudan. At the same time, what was lining up is that the dictator was kicked out of the country. The man who was bombing us and killing us and, and dropping bombs and burning villages down was kicked out. And suddenly there's this window of peace that there's been no fighting for so long, for about four years now. And so since we started this work of education, literally within the same month, the fighting stopped. And we have, been, have, and we have had favor to go into these communities and talk to them. God has allowed this trust. Like these people have been attacked for years and years and years to build an education system that needs years of trust. But God already established that. And so the work that we get to do with the people is so groundbreaking and so huge. And I see the potential of what we're doing. And, and within that, uh, many of you have, may have heard uh, Jonathan's testimony when he went with, with us. And in the first community that we're going to build the first school, the people, uh, uh, we, we did evangelism in the village. And that was even amazing. We were supposed to do evangelism somewhere else. And then God said, no, I want you to do it here. We went to the market. We preached God's word. Hundreds of people were coming, running from the mountains, crying and praying and accepting Christ in, this, in the place that we're going to build the very first school. And all of that, God, I didn't plan. A, most of this, I didn't plan. I ha I'll have an idea. And then God is like, okay, I'll provide that. The money that we needed for this, the money that we needed, I am like, okay, where, where am I going to get this money? Like, I need to hire 
you know, experts in edu- curriculum building and teacher training and all sorts of stuff. And I have not done many events. I haven't, I haven't had the opportunity to preach much because I was in school. God has provided the money to do everything that we've needed at the moment we've needed it. A simple prayer, God, we're at this moment, we need the money. I don't even ask anyone and suddenly someone writes a check that covers that amount. And that is what it means to walk in Christ. And so that is my challenge for you. I still want to tell you a little bit more about Tamu Mountains. But what my challenge is for you is that you have one life, one life. What are you doing with it? If you have had an encounter with God in the past, what was he calling you to do? Did you do it immediately? And did you, did you follow through with that faith? Or did you accept it and then kind of go back? Were you like Balaam or like Saul? I was like both at different times in my life. But just imagine what we can do with this life when we follow Christ and what he is able to put in our path to allow us to move on that path. It doesn't mean we won't suffer. It doesn't mean it won't be hard work. But it does mean there will be great glory for it in the end. I want to show you a video of what we've been doing with To Move Mountains. Um, It really sums up. I want you to see the faces of the teachers we've been training. I want you to see the faces of the people of Nuba. I want you to see the environment that they're in. Um, So please uh, watch this this video. I'm with my father, mother, my grandparents, and my uncle's hand cousins. They are coming to pray for me. I feel it is really painful because I'm leaving them. I finished class eight, seven, then I was to go to class eight. Then they were started. People really run and they confuse their mind and they could not even manage to learn. Sudan has been at war for over 30 years, and the Sudan government bombs villages, churches, schools, and hospitals. Its wars have caused a great lack of opportunity. Students are willing to walk hours and hours to come to a school made of rock and grass, sitting on stones and logs as they learn English and math. If there's a bombardment, the children have to run down the dark holes. There's a problem of uh, children to learn. They have developed kind of trauma. Love you, Lord, and we pray these things in your name. Amen. Education battles lack of opportunity. It battles lack of development, and in turn curbs things like immigration and extremism. It allows people to think for themselves and develop themselves. When I came to Uganda to study, I realized that education is one of the basic human rights. Everyone deserves to get education. The world is not something very small or confined. The world is very wide, and you have to learn what what is also taking place all over. When I was in Nuba, I didn't know God answered prayers. God answers prayers. 
We want to build a robust education system, a new curriculum, new teaching methods. We want to build it from the ground up and let it be something that lasts very long term. And we hope that this will help the people of Nuba and Sudan get out of war and find other solutions to their problems. What's good about this school? What do you wish was better? What other things are important for students to learn in school? What skills and knowledge does somebody need in order to build that? Too often, people come in with solutions to problems that they have never experienced, and often those solutions fail because they weren't created by the people who have to live them. It's getting that voice of the Nuba people to tell us what's important and what they want to get from it. We want our child to be associated with his identity and his language, who knows the values of Nuba people. We want to help him to have the spirit of cooperation with others. Anything else? The most important thing that I learned is two types of mindsets, growth mindset or fixed mindset. In the growth mindset, that's where you find yourself not giving up. However much hard the work is, despite the obstacles. You are building confidence in learners, and also the learners will feel that they are important and they have part to play. And the last one is we're going to do the knot, but we're going to do the knot as one whole group. Last time we did it in groups of six, a little easier. Today we're going to do it as a big group. I'm going to give you only eight minutes to try to solve it. Togetherness, teamwork, understanding, that will allow you to move forward instead of moving backward. Education is something big that includes many things like how you should live with people, how you should have peace with people, how you should do your best to help others. Here it is that Nubians are going to be teaching Nubians. The change will benefit their own children one day, so that's the best opportunity of all to make change. The people leading the change are the people who will have to live through that change. I believe that when we shall introduce this student-centered classroom, whereby students will interact with one another, uh, whereby the teacher is not on control of everything, they are going to learn better. We have our own curriculum, and we are not going to depend on people's curriculum in order to develop our country. My fellow brothers in Nuba, they will start to know that they are of great value in the world. Out of me, they're going to be doctors, they're going to be lawyers, they're going to be leaders who will later change Nuba Mountain. Becoming a teacher is the best decision I've made in my life. Thank you. Um, so some of the, I want to tell you about some of the teachers that you saw up there. I don't know if you, it, she looks very different at the beginning than she does at the end after six years. Chamu, at the beginning, the girl that you saw crying, um, and the one that you saw at the end talking there, um, it's hard to believe how much she has changed, and it's with all of our, our teachers that we've been training, um, he, seeing their English change over that, that period of time. And many of you are supporting them and, and helping us train them up. And every time we train them, we are also discipling with them and having Bible studies with them and, and telling them about Christ. And, uh, and, and like we just did a training in uh, Philippians, a study of Philippians the last time I was there. Um, and, and they're so eager and so hungry to know more. And these are going to be, when you're a teacher in Nuba, you're suddenly uh, put as a leader of the community. So these, we're really training the future leaders of community and training them how to be servant leaders like Christ uh, and, they're, and they're having great impact. Um, and then the, some of the uh, greatest news I want to tell you today um, is that 
Uh, we are remaining with only a year before me and my wife travel back full time with our children to Nuba. I go back quite a bit, um, but we are waiting until my wife finishes school and then we'll go back full time. Uh, within that time, we are going to try to finish the curriculum. I need prayer for this. We're going to try to finish the curriculum. We're going to try to finish training the teachers. And then the, the, the really good news is that uh, we just went back this time, and the community has given us a school that they constructed uh, that is built out of just ra- rock and grass that they try to rebuild every year when it gets destroyed by the rains. And they've given us the land. They've given us this school to now build it properly with a cement block and a metal roof uh, so that these kids have a good learning environment. And it's going to be a place where we've talked to the community. We want to have Bible studies for adults to come in. Um, And so we, last time I was there, I made this announcement in in the women uh, there, you know, like when people are happy and everyone kind of lets out this utilization, la, 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 you know, they, all the women were jumping up and dancing and singing. And then one man got up and he said, Ryan, thank you so much for this, but um, you're not doing all the work. And I said, okay. And they said, uh, who's going to bring the sand? And all the women jumped up and said, we are. And then uh, who's going to bring the gravel? We are. And like, so they said, we, they're going to do a lot of the work. And they want to do a lot of that work to build this school. Um, I can't tell you how much hope it's going to b- bring in that community uh, and it, how much lives it will change. Um, and that's, uh, I, I do, sorry, I put these videos a little bit too close together, but I want to show you a very quick video on that school so you can see what it looks like now and the conditions that the kids are learning in um, and just imagine what it could be like. <laughs> Women by your back, Barglum, be youth, Lakin Lisa, Gadin Yogro, Lisa Machin Bas, can you go to Sierra that to Lisa Zarimbas? Talim him as an Yal, Yarpan, whatever Tadunia down, Masheke, as an woman Yafam Zato, Ayal Quays, World Cup. One plus three. Who look for us this number? Hi everyone, this is Ryan Boyette. Uh, I am coming to you from the Nuba Mountains uh, at the school of Kuju Shabia. You can hear the children. Um, learning in the background in these classrooms that were built locally by the community and they've been running this this school for quite a long time and that is why we want to come alongside them and help them and work with them. Um, This school is going to be the first place where the new curriculum is going to be used uh, that we've been working on for over three years now where the new teachers are going to be trained. It's just going to be a place of creativity and education and learning and using that education in their community Um, And it's something that uh, I can't wait to see. So much potential here. And it's not just for the nearly 500 students in this school, but it's going to be a place where other teachers from different communities come and learn and then teach in their schools. Um, So I'm asking you to come alongside of us and the people of Nuba and of this village of Kujishabia um, and support the construction of this school. Sudan Hena, Anna Mamsud Git Gidan, Anna Daja de la Sasa Nena Dairen, Sitari. But in Talabas Data Betana and Amanishu Bunian, and in Amanishu Yani Tahir, Betatalwade, Bunian, Gedidua, Ajad Keda Sabit, Umuzat, Bukunin to Munia, Bukunin to Tomoash and Alam. When children see buildings coming up and their parents and aunts and uncles and sisters and brothers coming together with us um, to build permanent structures, it is highly motivating for these children. Right now they're going to school sitting on logs and and rocks and huddled over their paper, um, trying to frantically write down what the teacher's putting on the blackboard. Now just imagine when this school is built up, the motivation that kids will have to come and learn and parents to send their kids to school. Um, And I'm just asking that you please uh, help us and support us in building the school of Kuju Shabia. Thank you. So that was the pastor and his wife um, that you saw talking up there, and their children are in the school. Um, Just a testament of what God has done already. We started this fundraiser uh, two months ago, and I thought maybe it'll take a year to raise the money. Uh, We raised, we were asking for $450,000. Um, and I thought, man, how are we going to do this? In a matter of two months, we have raised now uh, $340,000. Um, I was completely blown away. 
uh, a big help of that. Uh, I had the opportunity to go see uh, Franklin Graham because uh, I used to work for Samaritan's Person. He has been a big supporter of our work. Um, he, he likes what we're doing. And so I went to meet him and I told him about this project. And he said, if you can raise 100000 I will match that 100000 So I, I, I asked a few people and a friend that I had met years ago uh, in Portland, who's a believer, and he said, uh, okay, if Samaritan's Purse is matching $100,000, I'll write the check for 100000 So that was 200000 right there. And then he said, and then I will match every single donation until the project's finished. So we don't have 110 remaining to raise. We only have 55000 remaining to raise. Um, so it's very exciting. Um, I cannot wait to break ground. The, the church, we, we set up a, a program that the next time we come, uh, we're going to invite the whole community and we're going to have a time of prayer uh, over the land and over the school. Um, it'll be a great time to evangelize the people. Um, and I'm really excited about that. Um, but if you would like to, to donate, I think we have a, a QR code. Um, you could scan that right now and make a donation right there. And, and it'll go straight to us, and it will go directly 100% to the school. Uh, on top of that, if, you, if, you're not, if you're not really sure how to use this, which I don't really know that well either, um, then you can go to our website, to movemountains.org, um, or we can talk after church. But uh, I just wanted to thank you all so much for this opportunity. Thank you for your time. Uh, I really love you all, and this church has been such an encouragement to us. Um, but God bless you, and thank you so much. Thanks, Ryan. Hey, we want to make sure that we really are coming alongside of him. So if, uh, if you want to leave that QR code up so you guys can access that, um, just even as we mill about here afterwards, or if you want to be able to give a check, you just put it, make it out to GCBC and put Sudan in the memo line, and we'll make sure it gets over to them. Uh, or if you just want to slip them cash, listen, wh whatever you have, what they're doing is providing hope. And, and not just a temporary hope, but an eternal hope. So make sure that we, we get behind them. You guys are just the most giving congregation that I, I've ever seen. And I'm so thankful for what you do to not just give, but to actually partner in ministry. So thank you for being a part of this. Uh, we're going to pray for Ryan. So uh, if you could just extend your hand out to him, uh, we're just going to pray on his behalf. Father, we thank you for Ryan and Jazeera and for the kind of husband he is to her, the kind of dad he is to his kids, and what that represents in the person of Jesus to a whole community that desperately needs to know that there is hope. Thank you for what you're doing in that community by providing ed education, and we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would change lives. Uh, the song we sang this morning of of resurrender, the song we sang about the Holy Spirit. God, that is what we pray for Ryan and for his family as they go minister to those people. So God, thank you for going out ahead. Thank you for giving him a sincere love. And I pray that you would provide all of their needs and then some. It is, it's amazing watching you answer prayer. And we are thankful. Heal those in our congregation who are sick right now. And thank you for caring for us and for your people. Thank you for being the definition of love. Do that in Ryan's life and let him be love to those people. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, church.